Every now and then, we face challenges that are bigger than we are. Every now and then, we look something in the eye and we say, I, I can't do that. Every now and then, we find something overwhelms us, either emotionally or physically. Something overwhelms us spiritually even. And we don't know what to do with it. It's so easy for us to forget that all of us are daily engaged in a battle. I'm not fond of the whole military motif for whatever reasons. I know there are those who really glorify that and really exonerate that and really honor that and love it. And I have great respect for you. This isn't personal to your point of view. But for myself, I'm proud of the fact that my father served. I'm proud of the fact that uh, we we have a tradition of honor. That's not what I'm saying. I just the the, the military side of things is a bit on the the sword edge for me. It's a bit on the hard edge. But we forget that the metaphor that applies to us in our daily lives is that of warfare. We forget that we're engaged spiritually in a battle all the time. At least I do. I'll speak for myself. I forget. Sometimes I lose track of where I am in all of that. Sometimes I am so tired, I don't care. Sometimes I feel overwhelmed. And when I feel overwhelmed, I feel powerless. And when I feel powerless, it's very easy to slip into depression. And when I feel depressed, I don't feel like I can accomplish anything. It's the antithesis to I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, this is not to say that when we experience sadness or fatigue or depression, we've somehow rejected God. This is not to say that when we, if we battle clinical depression, for example, we just don't have enough faith. So let's be crystal clear from the very beginning of what I'm saying here. This is not a condemnation of any of us for whether we have enough faith or not or whether we're walking the way we ought to walk or exercising it the way we ought to exercise. I'm here to tell you that part and parcel of the walk of humanity is to forget our context to forget the battle that we're engaged in, to find ourselves at times frustrated, fatigued, low, depressed, anxious, without what we perceive a way out, unempowered. And it's easy for us under those circumstances to go places we otherwise wouldn't in our lives, in our heads, in our spiritualities. It's important that we look for some model of hope out of this warfare. How is it that spiritually we're to survive? What does it look like biblically when we look at veterans of spiritual wars? We know what veterans of physical war look like, veterans of foreign wars. We read about the unintended consequences financially. We read about the tremendous loss of life and limb. We read about the psychological consequences, about illnesses that don't seem to have an an ideology. We can't find the source. We don't know what they lie in, but we know that side of it from Newsweek and Time, from news reports. We know of that from people we know who've come back from battle, stories that we've heard. But I don't know if we always think of Scripture in terms of stories of spiritual warfare, stories of veterans of spiritual battles. Ephesians 6, if you have a moment, turn there, gives us the sort of basic outline for this motif in very clear terms. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and he exhorts the congregation there to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now, that's a really powerful command. And it's one we can't accomplish on our own. 
It's the same kind of command that says we are to be whole, that is to say complete or perfect, as our Heavenly Father is whole or complete or perfect. It's the same kind of command that says you've been forgiven, now sin no more. It's the same kind of command as all of those because in order to fulfill it, we're going to have to be 100% in Christ. We're going to have to be all in in God. See, Be strong in the Lord means not that you are strong or I am strong or that I have developed the power to resist the vicissitudes of life and the battles engaged. It means I have to put my faith in, my trust in, my person in, my life in the hands of the Lord, and that He will be my strength just as He is my salvation. Does that make sense? Be strong in the Lord, the text says, because I can't do that myself. And in His mighty power. And then it admonishes me ways in which I can participate in this. Put on the full armor of God so that I can take my stand against the devil's schemes. For here's the truth. We don't struggle against flesh and blood. Well, we do some of that too, don't we? But against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We do a lot of this. We're constantly battling the machine, as it were. We're constantly doing battle with that which is soulless, faceless, nameless. It's a system. It's a principality. It's a thing out there we can never quite fully get around or conquer. And we're doing battle on more personal levels, aren't we? We have our individual things that we're tempted by or that we're working through that challenge us or bring us down. Put on the full armor, it says, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. It's not optional. Stand firm then with the belt of truth tucked around your waist buckled around your waist. The old-fashioned way of saying that in the King James was, gird your loins. I like that one. It's a great, great way of saying it, isn't it? Gird your loins. I can think of a variety of ways in which this is applicable. First of all, none of us wishes to be exposed, particularly in battle from the waist down. Secondly, the belt is that in which all of the tools of warfare hang. In the olden days, it was a sword that hung on the belt. In more contemporary times, it's the pistol or whatever else is going to be carried, the canteen, everything. Put on the battle then of truth, I mean the belt of truth. Buckle it around your waist. The truth is sometimes hard for us to get our heads around. Maybe that's something too that's revealed. With the breastplate of righteousness in place, Again, I don't know how to fulfill this command because there is only one righteous and it is not me. But apparently there is a way that God has of protecting me in His righteousness that I need to fully embrace. When I wake up in the morning, I need to determine that His righteousness will be my righteousness and that His armor will be sufficient for me. I need to put on my sandals, as it were, that speak of the gospel of peace. That tells us a little bit more about the big tools of our battle, doesn't it? We don't fight the same fight that others foe. We don't use the same weapons that our enemies use. We use weapons of peace. The gospel of peace. We use things like truth and righteousness and God's Word, the sword of the Spirit, which will come up in just a moment.
Our tools are different than the tools of physical battle, and we use different tools than our enemies within spiritual battle. In addition, take up the shield of faith. Oh, that's a tough one. How many days do I leave that one at home? And then I'm left dodging the arrows of the evil one. Not just arrows, but flaming arrows, dipped in tar, ready to burn as well as pierce. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How is it that daily I can determine that I am protected by the knowledge of God's salvation? It's really easy in battle to say, oh, I didn't do that very well, and to lose some sense of hope. Some of us grew up in a context in which any little deviation from what was acceptable in our minds in terms of what we thought God wanted from us might mean judgment. Any sin could separate us eternally from God in that moment. But Ephesians 6 tells us it doesn't quite work that way. Put on the helmet of salvation. You wear it where? Over your head, where your brain is. We accept the salvation God brings us and we wear it. We, we put it on every day. It protects the most vital aspects of who we are. That is not something that we negotiate from day to day or wonder about from day to day. That is what gives us the strength to fight. It isn't will I be redeemed, it is I have been redeemed. It isn't will I be saved, it is I have been saved. It isn't will I make it, will a place be found, but there is a home for me. That's the basis from which we fight. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, now we're talking about something altogether different. We're talking about the encouragement, the stories, the words that come to us over and over again as we think about what it means to be battling spiritually, what it means to be a veteran of a spiritual war. So we go back to our Gospel text in John 21. We have the reinstatement of Peter. I won't belabor this, but you know the story about the time Christ was crucified just before his crucifixion, right after the Last Supper. Christ has told Peter that he would deny him three times. And during his trial through the night, we find Peter doing just that and running away. Christ is crucified, dies, is buried, is resurrected, and comes back to be with the disciples. And there's Peter again. Only Peter has denied Christ thrice, three times, as was predicted. And now something stands between Jesus and Peter. Peter's not where he was in those moments of bravado in the upper room in which he says, I will die for you. Sometimes we're self-deceived. In addition to under, under great stress spiritually, we're self-deceived. We think that we can stand no matter what, but we can't. Not even Peter could. Three years in the presence of Christ, a Galilean. I mean, that's the equivalent of a gun-toting redneck in this country. Wasn't anybody going to tell Peter how things worked or were? Peter knew, and he, he had the bravado. He had the thrasos, as they say in Greek, the guts. And you know what we say in English. Peter was that kind of guy. Peter was going to stand. Only he couldn't. He couldn't. So here he now stands, a different person before Christ, in a different relationship than he had had with Christ up to that moment. And Jesus asks point blank, do you love me? It all comes down to love. Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Three denials, you know the story. Three times Jesus asks, and Peter's feelings are hurt. But in this moment, we get a glimpse of a battle that will be Peter's from this moment to the rest of his life. Jesus says to him the third time, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Verse 18, verily I tell you, 
When you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted, but when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Stretch out your hands and lead you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. If you look at the cover of your bulletin, there's a 16th century or 17th century rendering of Peter being crucified. Not only were his hands stretched out, but considering himself unworthy to follow in the path of the Lord, he was crucified upside down. Agony added to agony. You see, Jesus was letting Peter know, I will be with you. You're forgiven. You're mine. You're back. But one day, it's not going to go the way you think it might. One day your end might be harder than you imagine. One day taking up your cross and following me might be a literal thing, not a figurative thing. Are you still willing to be my disciple? Are you willing to fight that fight? Peter was a veteran of a spiritual war. When we go back to Kings 19, this is my favorite. We have a fantastic story of spiritual warfare. It plays itself out quite literally, but it also has a deeply spiritual component. And one I relate to, one I think probably many of us could relate to. Elijah has been in isolation. There's been a drought in Israel. And now it's time for a showdown. Israel has become apostate. They've worshipped the wrong God. And now it's time to see who's God. The priests of Baal are called to come forward. Elijah is there and on, Mount, on the mountain there in Mount Carmel, you can go to the site in Israel. The showdown takes place. You know the story, each construct an altar, each put wood upon it, each slay an animal and place it on the altar, and each dig a trench around the altar, and each pour a barrel of water over the animal and the wood and the rocks and into the trench. And then each try to bring down fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice. Well, you know who is God. And as Elijah prays, his prayer is honored. And at the end of that prayer, he puts to the sword the prophets of Baal. That's a lot of lives to take in a day. And in the face of all of this bravery, and in the face of this showdown, Elijah is heroic. He even taunts the priests of Baal. Where is Baal? Is he sleeping? Is he out taking a leak on the fence over there? Where is he? No, Elijah really says that. Actually, he uses much more graphic language than, than, than I just did. He taunts the priests of Baal, literally just taunts them. Makes fun of them in the process of the spiritual war. And then as they cut themselves to pieces, they weaken, weaken themselves as they're trying to get the attention of their God. And ultimately, Elijah lops their heads off. It's quite a day. Quite a day. He's on his way down from this incredible victory, this amazing uh, showdown on Carmel where he has been so incredibly strong in God. And God has honored him and shown himself to be God and honored himself. And we get to 19 and it says, Now Ahab told Jezebel the wicked queen, everything Elijah had done and how he'd killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. The queen now takes an oath to her God to have Elijah killed. Now, after what he's just been through, you would not think this would be much of a problem. 
Three years sustained in the wilderness by God. A showdown on Mount Carmel in which he's won a glorious victory. The entire fleet of prophets on the other side of the camp there on Baal's side wiped out. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Here's a man who just put to death hundreds of prophets of Baal, and now he's running from a woman a very powerful woman. When he came to Beersheba and Judah, he left his servant there while he went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom brush and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. That's depression. That's abject fatigue. There's nothing left that he has to give. So fatigued is he, he's got no hope that there's any point to the battle going on. He prays to die. Have you ever done that? Don't answer that. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread, baked over hot coals in a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again meaning he just fell right back to sleep. Then the angel came back around a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God, and there he went into a cave and spent the night. Does the 40 days and 40 nights ring a bell in the wilderness? And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Isn't that great? The angels just ministered to him in the wilderness. God knows where he is. God knows what he's doing, but here he is running through the wilderness away from this queen, and he finally said, the question is, what are you doing here? I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. It says, The Lord God said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. I want us to pay attention to this answer. I want you to hear what isn't said. God doesn't say, have you lost faith? God doesn't say, are you so tired that you've forgotten what my angel just did for you a little bit ago? God doesn't say, you're exaggerating. It's not true. There are other prophets. I have other people in Israel Get a grip. Have you noticed God doesn't do any of these? He doesn't argue with him. God doesn't cajole him. He doesn't say, come on, you're running from... We can handle Jezebel. This isn't a problem. What are you doing? He doesn't say, why are you afraid? None of that's there. No judgment. Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. All the elements that the people of earth have worshipped, God wasn't part of. But after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? I've been zealous. And now they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord said, verse 15, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint 
Haziel, king of Aram. Also appoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king of Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahaloah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, or whose mouths have not kissed him. We read later on that Elijah is taken into heaven. Here is a man who fought a spiritual war, a war against a principality, against a darkness, against a false system of religion, against a faith that wasn't a faith, against odds that were great, against a feeling of fatigue and loneliness, against the dryness of the land, against the will of the people and a king, against the wishes of an evil queen. He got tired. He grew faint. He needed ministry and mercy and a fresh image of God. He learned where the power was. God would not speak in these things, but would be speaking to him in a still, small voice. His armor is yours. His voice will still speak softly. And he bids us to go into our wildernesses and do his bidding because the battle belongs to the Lord. Freely we have received today and now I would call upon you to re prepare your offerings and your tithes that are to be returned to the Lord as the ushers collect them at this time.